The mountains are a place I've always considered home. Walking through the rocky landscape, I always found myself amazed at how little I knew about the different mountain systems around me. That's why I joined this podcast, to learn more about these systems and deliver it right to your ears. I'm Gabrielle Piska, and you're listening to the Canadian Mountain Podcast. In this episode, we will be talking about mountain systems in Canada and why they're so special. We will also be talking to two guests from the Canadian Mountain Network and what some of their work looks like. But before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to appreciate the land that we work on and the people we work with. The Canadian Mountain Podcast acknowledges that our conversations engage with diverse knowledge holders who live and work on unceded land and treaties 1 to 11 of Indigenous peoples. We also recognize the historical and ongoing oppression that many different cultures, lands, and nations have continuously faced within Canada. We hope to continue our work to help decolonize, change, and inspire media platforms to further collaborate with Indigenous peoples through storytelling and partnerships. Did you know there is more to mountains than their icy terrain, beautiful ski hills, and breathtaking views? Mountains themselves make up an array of different systems, of which includes connections between the land, people, and animals that live there. All of these different systems can get a little complicated, and that's why the Canadian Mountain Network supports research and understanding of our mountain systems. To help listeners such as yourself understand more about these mountain systems, the partnerships involved with the Canadian Mountain Network, and everything cold in between. The network became a federal nonprofit in 2019. It is dedicated to advancing our understanding of mountain systems. They do this through applied research based on Indigenous and Western ways of knowing. It is research like this that helps push the future of mountain understanding forward. You may have heard about mountain systems. In a simple definition, They're what make up all living and non-living things that surround mountain territory. But why are these systems so important? There's a lot to unpack here, which is why we'll be discussing this with our guests. In this episode, you'll hear from two different perspectives that reflect on both Indigenous and Western understandings of mountain systems. You'll also get to hear more about what the Canadian Mountain Network is and some of their main goals. Our first guest, Norma Cassie, helped lead the design and development of the network and serves as a Yukon-based co-research director with the network. I'm Norma Cassie. I'm Bantad Kuchin. I'm People of the Lakes. I come from northern Yukon territory where I was raised and, uh, and been really interested in biodiversity and everything like that. So my whole life work has led me up to being uh, co-director of the Canadian Mountain Network an NCE grant entity that's pretty awesome and great to be a part of because of it's now opening uh, avenues and opening ways for Indigenous peoples to do their own research. Norma also serves as Senior Advisor with the Indigenous Leadership Initiative that advocates for Indigenous Guardians programs across Canada. She is also a faculty member at McGill University in Montreal where she works with students to explore Indigenous research methods and Indigenous approaches to conservation. Also joining us from several provinces over is Murray Humphreys, an associate professor who specializes in wildlife ecology at McGill University in Quebec. My name is Murray Humphreys, and together with Norma Cassie, I'm a co-research director at the Canadian Mountain Network. I'm a professor of wildlife biology and serve as the academic director at the Center for Indigenous Peoples, Nutrition and Environment at McGill University. McGill University and McDonald Campus, where I work and live, is situated in the traditional territory of the Ganye Gahaka, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange. Murray is also the Canadian Mountain Network's other co-research director and also serves as the director for the Center of Indigenous Nutrition and Environment. I met up virtually with both Norma and Murray to talk about what mountain systems mean to them and why studying them is vital to the network. So how would you describe the network's main goals in a couple of sentences? The goal of the network is Canadian Mountain Network objective is to invest in multiple ways of knowing 
uh, to support indigenous ways of knowing as well as Western knowledges to advance knowledge about mountain systems and to apply that knowledge to better futures for, for mountain places and mountain people. I think just to add to that, it's also really focused on building partnerships, building partnerships in Canada that's really needed with the academic and science community along with Indigenous peoples. Um, I think that's a really important part of our work as the Canadian Mountain Network. Now, Marie, what made you decide to step into the role of co-research director? Just recognition of research excellence and knowledge excellence and innovation in its many forms. And I think as a university-based researcher in a time when we're trying to better understand the role of a diversity of knowledge approaches and a diversity of, of knowledge holders and, and how they can work together to generate knowledge that helps to, to make for better futures. I think that just the opportunity to be a part of a network that is, to me, really at the cutting edge of that that innovation and to be able to learn from people in the network uh, that have a lot more experience working at, at those interfaces than, than I do. And that's local Indigenous knowledge holders, it's university-based researchers, it's, it's partner organizations, it's all its government supporters of the network. It's all those people in a space where they're committed to working together to advance knowledge in an inclusive and equitable uh, way. So it's just, a for me, a super exciting opportunity to learn uh, and grow as a researcher. So now for the both of you, in your own words, how would you define mountain systems in relation to how the network defines them? I think, you know, what is a mountain is always a question and, and what is a mountain system and what makes it special and unique and different than, than other places. And, and when I think of mountain systems, I think about integrated kind of a holistic approach that connects people to place, to landscape, and just the incredible generality that, that uplands and highlands are, are different than the lowlands that surround them, uh, different in lots of really important ways. And that uh, diversity, I'm a wildlife biologist, so I think a lot about wildlife diversity and biological diversity. And, and anytime you change elevation, you change diversity, you change the species that are present and you change the, the people's relationship to those, those places. So whether they're little mountains in the Southern Quebec or, or monster mountains in the Yukon or, or the Rockies, that place is special, uh, special to a lot of people that live in them and, and around them. And so I, that's how I see mountain places. These mountains are very, very special and sacred to our communities, wherever our ancestors have situated our communities, for many special reasons, for the clean water that it provides. That's pretty much uh, like one of the main ones. And also, we refer to them as grandmothers and grandfathers. The highest peaks of the mountains, we call them grandfathers. And the little bit lower next level is the grandmothers. In, in from our ways of looking at things in our language. And they, these mountains that our ancestors built near, nearby or underneath or beside, we hardly ever built on top of them. Those are where we camp and where we hunted. But they were, those mountains were really important to building our people physically, mentally, and emotionally. So we go and up, climb those mountains and uh, so that we could build the physical tenacity and our emotional well-being while we were growing up. And that was a major part of our, our ways of being near these ecosystems. And then we don't look at one thing at a time. It's not just mountains. We look at, we look at the entire ecosystems that's connected to the mountains. In that connection, we are connect, connected to the entire world from our perspective. Now, a question for the both of you. Um, what are some things that maybe the average person should understand about the Canadian Mountain Network that they may not know? A lot of people do know about the Canadian Mountain Network, uh, and they also know our team, and they watched us grow they, along with us. I think there's a lot of the population out there that still we need to engage with and network with that, that need to fully understand and support what the Canadian Mountain Network is, is doing. In particularly, like it's, you know, we're working with scientists and academics and indigenous peoples and the youth HQP will be high school level, you know, in some cases, and we're, we're breaking new ground. 
we're actually breaking new ground and it's very exciting. There's still a hesitancy about research and trust that remains with our communities. We need to kind of help that open up and encourage people to see that we can achieve Indigenous-led research and have relevancy, respect, and uh, tangible outcomes from research that could assist our communities in growing and moving forward. For me, I just highlight because it's, it, as Norma said, we're getting to be well known and, and many people know the organization well, but those that don't, uh, if they just see the name Canadian Mountain Network, then the, the major focus of the network on multiple ways of knowing and a respectful engagement of Indigenous knowledge systems may be not apparent to everybody. And I think that the, the inclusion of, of First Nations and Métis and Inuit peoples of Canada and, and their knowledge and their knowledge priorities, more than just a, a research network, we're a, a training network, a relationship, you know, a network focused on relationships and trust and an application of knowledge to local priorities. So my next question is for you, Norma. So I was just wondering um, if you could tell me a little bit about your passion for science in kind of northern Canada. I know that you were raised in Yukon, but what made you want to kind of continue pursuing research in the north? Well, I was raised on the land. Like I was born into like a, a baby going into um, my area in Old Crow Flats in North Yukon. It's known as North America's second biggest wetland where I was able to engage with thousands of birds. I believe 143 species of birds come into my homelands, converge there, they molt there, they have their young ones there and there's eggs everywhere. And we pick some eggs once in a while when we're hungry for an egg, it's usually geese eggs. And then hundreds of thousands of caribou walk by me while I'm laying on the ground grunting. They're grunting around me, walking around me past where my mom just put me down so she could hunt. I became very, very connected um, uh, to, to that kind of biodiversity. So I know every plant, I know every animal, I know every insect in my area. And I know them also by my Guchin name, the Guchin, um, my language. And my grandfather trained me so that I could someday be sitting in this chair talking to you in this way, I guess, um, because he told me things. And he also told me the predictions of what's going to happen in the, in, throughout my entire life. So being in a pandemic right now is not surprising to me. Um, just how fast it operates and everything like that is a concern. However, our people have been through a lot of that. So I bring a lot of Indigenous science as well from my own country into this work. And, um, and that knowledge has always been profound in the choices that I have made in my life to um, fight for biodiversity, to fight for our children's future. That was uh, pretty much had to do a lot with where I was raised and what I was asked to do and that it was my obligation to do this and to live a good life to do it. So um, yes, I was groomed in a huge land, no classroom, not boxed in in any way because I didn't like being boxed in anyways. I couldn't handle it very well. And then just taking that biodiversity science with me in every step that I took in the, to, to the future. Now my next question's for Murray. What made you decide you want to study wildlife ecology? Yeah, I just grew up one of those kids that grew up uh, loving the outdoors and loving the wildlife around. I can remember walking into bookstores as a kid and I'd see all the different books and I liked books, I liked reading, but then I'd see the wildlife books and the pictures of wildlife and I just get this incredible excited feeling in my stomach when I saw it just because I wanted to look at them and, and open them and then to have opportunities as a as a kid to see them in real life and, and start to discover wildlife and wild places and my grandparents had a farm and so I spent a lot of time on that farm and the wildlife around that farm and, and I think just from that I just... I couldn't help myself. I just had a love for wildlife and a love for wild places. And importantly, for the people that live in those places and, and the people that drive livelihood from, from land. I wanted to 
spend my life with wildlife. So I went away to university to, to learn more and, and gain some degrees and things like that. But I, I don't think I've ever lost track of the fact that the people that have the most vested knowledge and interest in, in protecting those places and those species are, are the people that live in those landscapes. Uh, so I just have a real uh, now the opportunity to, to come back through research relationships. And I've, I've had a wonderful opportunity to, to spend a little bit of time in North Yukon in, in Norma's homeland in the old crow flats and, and been able to visit Norma in her in her camp one time and, and to experience a little bit of, of the knowledge and that, that she has. It's just a very rich career opportunity to spend so much time learning from people uh, in, in such a diverse array of landscapes, uh, so many different species in different places. So my next question for you, Norma, is can you maybe explain in simple terms what community-based research looks like? Well, I've done a couple of community-based research, um, basically how that work was through the Arctic Institute of Community-Based Research that we started uh, in 2007 to begin to bring the, the rights of our people to do research the way that they want to do it and because they, they have so much knowledge so that going in, we don't go into a community, we don't tread on tri other tri tribal lands without permission what happens with that is that we we created the, the an institute that was already well known by us going out to the communities and introducing what we were trying to do and create. Then we went to all the Yukon First Nations communities, just like Thelma and Louise. We drove all over Jody Butler Walker and I and went to every general assembly, outdoor assemblies, chief and council meetings spoke on the radio and let people know that we were starting this institute that's going to do community-based research with Indigenous peoples. And the preference for me was that the, the, the First Nations governments will choose, ask us to come in with, to assist them with any specific research that they would like to do. And then we had the ability to, pay, to sit down with the chiefs and, and let them know what is out there in terms of funding, what is their interest in what type of research, and it was in the area of climate change, food security, youth wellness and education, also chronic diseases. Those were the top priorities. Climate change, adaptation, climate change was huge. So then I let the chiefs know that about various funding, and I said these are things that could be available. So question, my next question for Marie is that your research focuses primarily on wildlife behaviors and interactions. How do you feel that your research contributes to the definition of what mountain systems are? Yeah, just mountains are special uh, everywhere. Mountains host in general more diversity and, and, and more specific species than, than many other places. But as much as my research likes to focus on wildlife and interactions, it, it also focuses a lot on the knowledges and relationships of people with those wildlife. And, and so I think um, it relates to place-based research in mountain systems and, and the way that wildlife is this incredibly valuable resource for so many different people, uh, from tourists visiting mountains to in Indigenous peoples living there and relying on those those wildlife species as a source of food security, as a source of, of identity, as a basis of knowledge and oral histories to recreational harvesters that use those landscapes and, and all the potential conflicts that can arise from, from different people valuing wildlife in the same place in different ways and, and how uh, research can contribute to to finding sustainable solutions around wildlife conservation and protection that, that listen to, to people and their knowledges and their needs. Now, a question for Norma. Can you tell me a little bit about your institute's research, research process? I know you went over that pretty much already, but maybe just going into a little bit of detail, a little bit more about how that works in terms of bringing in the youth and training them to kind of be a spokesperson and all that. Research process is that we want to we want to look at and engage in our research that's going to be really relevant for us and others that we live with in the same area knowledge that's going to be brought out of that research that's going to educate future generations as a whole where we always seek that kind of knowledge not just for one person but like a whole of a community for example that they could learn from it and bringing the youth in there 
And especially when we are living in this time, really challenging times and moving forward, like we are in a place where we have created a world that's going to be very, very challenging for humanity going forward. So we need to bring our youth, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, together and work together. If they choose to learn from us, we need to be open to educate non-Aboriginals and Aboriginal students together so that they can live together and move forward together and have a possibly another new way of learning, you know, learn from Indigenous peoples and learn from us. Like we've, we've been here for thousands and thousands of years. My people dates back to 25 to 30,000 years. Those are numbers that they throw around. But we've had artifacts on top of the highest peaks of these mountains when the big floods came and when the ice moved. We, 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 we have all those stories so we have knowledge <laughs> and uh, so we need to um, we need to work together. We need to work together for science and research that's relevant now for this challenging times that has been created. So my next question for you, Norma, what are some things that the average person should understand about this type of research that they may not know? I know you talked about bringing in Indigenous and non-Indigenous specifically to learn from Indigenous. Yeah, we live in a really beautiful, diverse country called Canada. It's one of the most collaborative countries in many ways, getting better in developing partnerships and understanding each other going forward. Um, there's been a lot of truths that came out about Indigenous peoples and how we were treated. The, the science that has done so much damage to our people over the years is out there. It's, being, it's out there. It's time for the youth to look at that history, to look at that history and change it. We need to, those young people need to look at that history, learn from it and change it. And, uh, and work together. And there's a lot of really awesome, incredible research to be done out there within our biodiversity, about our climate, uh, about everything that, that all the elements that give us life every day and, uh, and be able to understand it and go forward together. So my last question for you is what advice would you give to listeners who will be listening to this podcast episode who are interested in learning more about mountain systems? Get on board network, connect with us, look at the possibility of more NCEs and more resources availability for more entities such as the Canadian Mountain Network and work in collaboration, work with us, work with Indigenous peoples, be open to that and we be open to working with um, academic research in collaboration. Yeah, I just encourage people to look for knowledge and, and opportunity where they they may not be aware it exists and that we all tend to, to know certain, <laughs> there's a few opportunities we know well and, and many opportunities that we know almost nothing about and, and we may, through our ignorance, just assume they don't exist. But there's, as Norma has just said, Canada is such a diverse country and just so many knowledgeable people in, in so many parts and that you can't, you know, you can't see them all from the road, so to speak, in Canada. And so to, to spend some time exploring places and in an, with an open mind and, and, and making sure to pay respect to the people that live there and recognize you're in the homeland of people wherever you are in the country and, and to, to get the opportunity to, to get to know those people and their knowledges and some of the opportunities that working with them in a respectful way can present. Uh, so that would be my encouragement. That was Norma Cassie and Murray Humphreys, the co-research directors for the Canadian Mountain Network. The two will continue collaborating with the network to study different mountain systems and biodiversities throughout the Yukon and other Canadian landscapes. Through their ongoing research, they hope to continue building a stronger relationship between Indigenous and Western research methods. Thank you to our guests, and we hope to continue discussing mountains and why these special places deserve our attention and care. And that's it for this edition of the Canadian Mountain Podcast in partnership with Mount Royal University. Thanks for listening. This podcast was produced from Treaty 7 territories, of which is immersed in ancient culture and storytelling. With the Canadian Mountain Podcast, our goal is to share both Western and Indigenous ways of storytelling. And we give appreciation to the stories that have been told on this land and shared through generations. 
Therefore, we give acknowledgement to the hereditary keepers of these lands, the Nitsitsapi Blackfoot, the Stony Nakoda, and the Sutuna and Métis Nations. I'm Gabrielle Piska, and special thanks to show producer Eric Tanner. Be sure to join us again for more stories surrounding mountain places, whether that be in your own backyard or from around the country. Share and subscribe to get the latest updates on the new seasons, and be sure to tell your mountain-loving friends and colleagues. You can find us wherever you find your podcasts, and you can learn more about the Canadian Mountain Network at canadianmountainnetwork.ca.